Uh, so those are nice rational numbers, and what it and they sound nice because actually it's interesting to think about why they sound nice. They sound nice because of stuff about the physics in your ear. If you hear one of those sounds, it wiggles the little hairs inside the cochlea of your ear, but they that tell you what pitch you're hearing. But because of this effect called resonance, it also wiggles the hairs that want to wiggle at some other speed that's related to the speed that you're hearing by some rational number. So if you hear a sound, your ear also sort of hears as if, as if it was hearing an octave higher or a fifth higher. And so that's why when you play both of those sounds, your ear is particularly happy. It sort of goes, ah, oh, yeah, 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 it's, uh, it's working. And, and it's just a purely physics mechanism, which you can see more easily by taking a piano, holding down the pedal, and like plucking or, or, or pounding one of the notes, and then like cover up all the strings except for the note that's one octave higher. And you'll hear that that one has got wiggling too. So in other words, when you wiggle something, it makes anything near it that can wiggle at the same speed want to wiggle too. But also things that wiggle twice as fast, and also things that wiggle like one and a half times as fast, or four thirds as fast, any nice fraction will do. Because basically one vibration will sort of get the other vibration going in sync with it. And if they match every third time or every second time, that's, that's good enough. And this happens all over the place. So this is a picture of a little portion of the rings of Saturn. It's a real close-up of the rings of Saturn. And people have been studying the rings of Saturn and noticing, so what is the rings of Saturn? It's a bunch of dust and rocks going around in circles around Saturn, and ice. Uh, but it likes to go in certain places much more than others. So here it's bright because there's lots of stuff there, but right here it's dark because there's not much. And the pattern that the rings of Saturn form is incredibly complicated. As you can see, there are lots and lots of these stripes, and it's not coincidence or anything. It's a very complicated mathematical pattern. And the reason is that if you've got a moon going around Saturn, and Saturn actually has a bunch of moons, if you have a, but if you take one of the moons of Saturn, then any little piece of dust that would be going around some orbit that had a frequency that was some nice rational number times the frequency of your moon, it'll tend to get in resonance and it'll tend to actually get pushed out of its orbit. So this black area, this relatively dark area here, for example, is called the Cassini division. It's a certain thing that the astronomer Cassini, who was one of the first to study the, moon, the uh, rings of Saturn saw, you just saw, that, hey, look, there's a black circle there. It means that there's not much stuff there. The reason why is because stuff that would be there would be going around just exactly twice as fast as a certain moon of Saturn called Mimas. And all these more complicated patterns are coming from more complicated rational numbers. But the point is, the golden ratio is the furthest away, in some sense, from any rational number. It's the hardest to approximate by rational numbers that, have, that are simple. And so the golden ratio is sort of the most stable uh, orbit. Things that are related by the golden ratio to some moon are the most stable, and so you'd find a lot of stuff there. And people have observed that phenomenon in a lot of situations. So it's oh, far away from being in resonance with, with any rational number, so to speak. So you could say it's because five is sort of awkward, it doesn't match up very nicely with any rational number. Here's another example of how the number five is sort of awkward. You could say, well, okay, I didn't succeed in tiling the plane with pentagons, but when I tried, at least it folded up to form this nice shape, the dodecahedron. So maybe I can fill up three-dimensional space with these guys. I can take a bunch of these guys and pack th three-dimensional space with them. But if you try to do that, that doesn't work either. You get these annoying little cracks here. So like, it comes darn close to, fill, to perfectly fitting, but it doesn't quite work. Uh, and so that's another example about how like, nothing quite matches when you're dealing with a number five. But you could say, well, OK, tough. I'll just keep on going ahead. It didn't quite work. But I'll just stick on another layer of these dodecahedra anyway, as if I was still. So I'm putting on a new layer of these guys onto the ones that I already had, and matching them up perfectly on these pentagon faces. Of course, now the cracks are getting worse. So you may wonder why I'm doing this. Well, I'm building up the suspense. That's what I'm doing. And so, 
So then I s stick on another layer. Well, it's getting even more worse. It's getting to be lots of room. And another layer. Well, it's getting even worse. And then I'll put on one more the decahedron, not a whole nother layer, just one more. You notice that's just this, well, it's hard to tell, but it's, that's just the same as that was before. One more, and now if you count them, obviously there are exactly 120 of them. Uh, um, and then you can say, okay, what's so great about that? Well, here's what's so great about that. So I said that with the, the decahedron, there, if you tried to tile the plane with pentagons, it didn't work so well, but if you curl it up into the third dimension, then it fits together into this beautiful shape. So now here, similarly, this thing is a mess. It didn't really, didn't really work. But if you curl it up into the fourth dimension, then you get some great thing. You get what's called the 120 cell. It's a four-dimensional shape that has 120 dodecahedra. And well, you may not be used to visualizing four-dimensional things, but uh, take my word for it. You, you can do it. You just need to imagine some direction that's at right angles to every one that I can point at. So it's us, you know, just sort of like imagine it's over there or something like that. <laughs> Don't <laughs> and and somewhere where you're not looking too carefully, you know. Uh, and and so. The surface of this 120 cell will be like a sphere, but in the fourth dimension. So there'll be like four different directions you can go. And it will be covered with 120 of these guys. Now, how do you visualize it, though? I am trying to fool you into imagining that you could visualize it. Well, it turns out there's another way to try to visualize it. So the surface of it is a kind of sphere, but it's not a two-dimensional sphere. It's not, it's, sorry, it's not a sphere like the normal. Mathematicians call this thing a two-dimensional sphere. Why is it called a two-dimensional sphere? Because it takes two numbers to say where you are on the sphere, like the latitude and longitude. So mathematicians would say a three-dimensional sphere is the surface of a ball in four dimensions. So if I was on a two-dimensional sphere, like on the Earth, in fact, I am on a two-dimensional sphere, I could walk in any direction, and if I was patient enough, I'd loop around and come all the way back. I won't demonstrate that now, although you may <laughs> wish I would, but I'm not going to. Uh, so similarly, it's possible that the universe is a three-dimensional sphere. No one knows, in fact, if it's true or not, but it's possible, and there's no evidence to rule it out. What would it mean? It would mean that if you took a spaceship and you just shot off in some direction and went on and on and on and on and on and on, then millions of years later, you'd appear, but coming back from the other direction, coming from there. So like if I shot up there, and you wait, 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 I come back up from here. So that, that's the idea of a three-dimensional sphere. So we could be in a three-dimensional sphere for all we know, and that's nice because then you can imagine what the surface of this 120 cell would be like. You'd be, it would be like being in here, being in the surface of this thing, but it would be chopped up into 120 dodecahedra. And that's something I can actually show you a picture of. So it would look like this. So this thing has 120 dodecahedra separated by these pale blue bubble membranes. They look curved, these surfaces, but that's because I've tried to take this three-dimensional sphere and stick it into a three-dimensional normal space, which isn't a sphere, at least near on such short distance scales. It's not a sphere. So it's more or less flat in this room or on this picture. Uh, if you actually counted all these bubbly things, you'd be upset at me because you would only see that there are 119 of them, not 120 of them. But the reason why is the 120th one is where? Where's the 120th one? It's the outside. Yeah, the, the rest of it, all this stuff on the outside, is also a dodecahedron. It has, 100, it has, a, it has 12 of these pentagon faces. So we've chosen to take one of them to be the outside, uh, and then the rest of them to be the inside.